So let's look at flatness applied to a surface. So here we have an application of an end cap that's supposed to mount to this black part and maintain a seal on that bottom surface. So the bottom surface where it mounts will be selected as our datum feature. That's going to be A. It creates a plane on the high points. But we still don't know how rough and wavy the actual surface is. So that's why we qualify the datum feature with a flatness. Flatness is a pretty easy one to explain because the tolerance zone is your default two parallel planes. And those parallel planes aren't related to any datum. It's just to itself only. So in 3D, you have your ugly looking surface that has some variation in it. And you maintain that variation with those two parallel planes in 3D space. So that's going to control how concave the surface could be. It controls how convex the surface could be. And also how wavy that surface could be. Because look at the tolerance zone of two parallel planes, two parallel planes, or two parallel planes. The other one that's a little bit harder to explain is the potato chip effect, and that would also be maintained by the flatness tolerance. Now, where do we apply flatness tolerance? Usually it will be on ceiling surfaces or qualifying a datum feature. Mounting surface is another place that we like to apply it. Let's say that we have this mounting surface and it's produced convex. What happens when it mounts to the mating part? Well, it might kind of rock on there a little bit. So you want to control the stability on your mounting surface, so we like to put a nice flatness tolerance on there. Now maybe it's not going to rock though, because you're going to take some bolts and torque those down at 250 newton meters. It's not going to rock. What are you going to do? Bend or distort the parts. So to minimize that distortion, we like to put on a tight flatness tolerance to keep that stress at as minimum as possible. Another part would be things that come together and move. Let's say a brake disc or a clutch. You want to maximize the contact between the pieces. Or heat transfer and electrical contacts have good flatness tolerance to get good signal across there as well. Our most common application for flatness tolerance would be to qualify your datum feature. The datum is a perfect plane on the high points, but that ugly looking surface we want to maintain with that flatness. Another place that we use flatness tolerance is as a refinement of your profile tolerance. So your profile tolerance, remember, is location. That controls where that surface can be relative to your datum A. Control how tall and how short it can be within that plus or minus 0.3. The problem with a big profile tolerance is that it also allows the flatness tolerance to be within that 0.6. So you might say, I don't care if you cut it high or you cut it low or cut it crooked, but make sure you cut it flat when you cut it that surface. So that will create a refinement. Your profile zone is spec'd out as the plus or minus 0.3 centered around your 25 basic. But the flatness tolerance has no datum, so it's going to be a best fit refinement of that surface. Cut it high, cut it low, or cut it crooked. Just don't cut it out of flat. Also, a common thing with flatness tolerance is when you have it on a datum feature, look how the datum is contacting the highest points. And the flatness is all to the inside of the datum. So flatness is like a unilateral when it's on that datum feature because the datum contacts the high points. But when you have this top surface, there's no datum here. So it's really just going to be the best fit two parallel planes that contains all the points on the surface. So let's show how we could measure flatness tolerance with a more accurate dial indicator here. So we've got a granite surface plate, nice flat surface that we can mount the part to. Also our height gauge is mounting on that with a nice flat bottom. So when I move this indicator around, this tip should be moving in a parallel plane to the table. So now I would adjust the dial indicator down until we get a little bit of preload there. And then we would zero out the indicator. So now we can traverse across this surface and collect some data. Now what you might be noticing here is I'm not actually measuring flatness. I'm actually measuring parallelism. Because let's say that this surface was tilted, and you have it resting down on this bottom surface, it will treat it like this is a datum. And your dial indicator will give you a reading from here to here. Remember, that's not the flatness. The flatness has to be best fit to the surface. Now, it's hard to best fit the dial indicator. So what we might do instead is use a shim. So it seems to be reading a little low on this side over here. So then we would put a shim under this side. Now, can you imagine if I put a shim right underneath here, do you see how that's going to bring that surface up and level it out and give you a more accurate reading on what your flatness really is? So that's what you'd have to do with the dial indicator and flatness, is you have to best fit the surface underneath the dial indicator. 
Now, not only do you have to best fit left to right, you also need to shim front to back too because you have a three-dimensional variation here. All right, now a very accurate way to measure flatness. It's time consuming with all the dial indicator and the shimming in there. But I want to talk about what could go wrong. Where I say it's flat, but it's not really flat. Well, you might say, well, you missed that spot right there. Okay, I'll get that spot. What about that spot over there? Okay, I'll get that spot. What about this spot over here? Okay, I'll get that one. Well, there's an infinite number of points here, right? So how many do you check? Enough until you feel comfortable, but you'll never be 100% confident. So that's really important here that you'll never be able to measure every single point, but you measure enough until you feel good about it within your measurement of certainty you find acceptable. Sometimes I ask this question, how would you measure that flatness? And people come back with, well, how much money do you have? And that's a major part of this, right? How much time and effort do you want into this? That's may determine what your cost would be and how much accuracy you need. Now let me show you another method that we use is they use gauge blocks. So they'll take two gauge blocks three would be better, that are supposed to be calibrated to be the same height. So now I can take these and put them on the table. We flip the part over, and then we can take our dial indicator, bring it up, and flip this the other way, and then we can go underneath the part. Now what's nice about this, you don't have to worry about shimming and adjusting. You pretty much level to that face right away and collect some information. So it is less time consuming, but it is a little less accurate. So I want you to look at what type of uncertainty, what extra things could go wrong with this measurement based on the previous one. Well, you can't touch where the gauge blocks are resting, so those are unknown areas. And plus, if I set it up like this and you set it up like that, that's going to be a slightly different scheme. Also a big problem, can you imagine if this was a big heavy part and you support it over here and you support it over here, what's going to happen in the middle? It's going to sag. So sagging under its own weight can throw you out by the flatness measurement you're trying to do. Also, if you were measuring a real small plastic part, when you put the plastic part on here, this indicator actually has a force on it, and that force can be enough to move the part around. So what could be a perfect check for a nice little machine part would be a terrible check for measuring sheet metal or plastic or a big heavy part. And that's really why the standard likes to stay away from inspection. <laughs> they don't tell you how to measure anything in the standard. They tell you what the tolerance zone is, two parallel planes. Now, how are you going to measure that? Well, that's just a whole different side of engineering that we call quality engineering. And that's where we put the experts in there to look at what the specification is, the theory behind it, and then come up with a fast, accurate, and cheap way to measure parts. Let me show you another thing you can do with flatness tolerance here. You can apply it per unit area. So here we have a relatively large surface. 470 millimeters by 320 millimeters. And let's say we want the surface to be flat within 0.5. So that 0.5 flatness tolerance, pretty simple, creates a tolerance zone of half a millimeter wide and allows the surface to be concave, convex, or even could be wavy within like this. Now even though the flatness could be 0.5, notice how that area could bump out in a small distance, a small portion of that. So they apply it on a per unit basis to refine that overall flatness. So now you have a flatness of 0.1 per, that's that slash means per, and then per every 20 by 20 millimeters. So this creates a series of 20 by 20 tolerance zones that have a smaller distance between them, 0.1. And those are going to be floating inside of the bigger tolerance zone of half a millimeter. Now this does create a series of tolerance zones, and they are an infinite number of overlapping tolerance zones. And that's making sure that each portion of it is flat smaller than the overall. So you could have a gradual change of flatness. Let's say across the entire thing, you could have a flatness problem within the half a millimeter. But then you have a smaller set of zones that are floating inside that are overlapping each other and making sure the rate of change is no more than the point one. This is common on larger surfaces and say, oh, I want this entire surface flat within 0.1. Manufacturing says, no way, that surface is humongous. That's going to be a really difficult tolerance to hold. And you say, well, actually, I can allow the flatness tolerance to be half a millimeter as long as it's a gradual change from high to low. But each localized area here has to be within the 0.1 every 20 millimeter section. So it's a spec relief. We start with a 0.1 tolerance on everything. Manufacturing says, no way. Okay, what can we do to get what I want for function, but get an easier to manufacture part? So we apply a bigger flatness overall, and then a rate of change per unit area.